Hello and um, good morning everybody. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, it is a pleasure and an honor uh, to present uh, Professor Dr. Hayes Bauske. Uh, he is a, a full professor of mathematics at the University of British Columbia in Kelowna campus in Canada. His research interests lie in optimization and, and nonlinear analysis. Dr. Bauske uh, has also authored more than 150 referee publications, including several books. In the Massimet database, he has more than 6,400 citations in more than 3,600 publications. He has also collaborated with engineers from industry, published in IEQ journals, uh, recited to patents, and he became a SIAM fellow in 2024. And that's uh, my presentation. And please, uh, Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you very much for coming on such a beautiful day when the pool is there and it's much more tempting to jump into that beautiful water. So I just want to make sure you're in the correct room. Okay, so if you're not in the correct room, you have an opportunity to leave. And I'm, I'm talking about joint work that I did with um, uh, Theo, who was actually a, a postdoc with me in Kelowna. And uh, because some of you know John Bowen very well, he was technically uh, John Bowen's very last student. He couldn't be even start. Okay, so he was about to start with him. So there's a connection to, to Newcastle. And he did his, his PhD, Theo, uh, with uh, Warren Morris, who was a postdoc of John Bowen. And Walla Moussi is now a prof in Waterloo, and some of you know her very well. So that's John work with him. And I really would like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to speak about this, because I really like this topic a lot. Um, so I hope you will enjoy it too. And if you look for new problems, there's there's some very nice problems there. I mean, some of you are so awesome. Eres el tío. <laughs> Maybe you, you saw it next week. You know, it's good to be. <laughs> Okay, so let me get started. This is I'm, I'm going to do a little bit of a reminder about the concepts here because I didn't really quite know what to expect in terms of background. So um, we're going to be working in a Hilbert space, but this is a talk where this is interesting even in RN. Okay, so unlike another talk I gave here uh, where it's really about Hilbert space, this is this is cool in RN. Okay, and we have a map in T from X to X, and we say it's firmly non-expansive if this condition holds here, okay? So that's a that's a standard condition and optimization for algorithms. So it's a, it's a famous property. And uh, they show up, I will explain this as I go along. <clears throat> they show up in monoton operator, view and optimization, because these operators correspond to if you come from monoton operator theory, they correspond to resolvents. So the identity plus A inverted is a beautiful operator that is single valued and has this property. So that's a nice property. They include proximal metrics, very important operators in optimization. If you minimize optimization problems where some of the pieces feature non-differentiable functions, or if you have constraints, the projection mapping is an example that has this property. Okay, so, so there's a lot of uh, examples here for these operators. Just a quick background. We will focus today on the linear case or a fine case. So if C is a, a closed linear subspace, um, if C is a closed linear subspace, it turns out the definition of firmly non-expansive action holds there even with equality. And that's just like the Pythagoras theorem. This is what you expect from Pythagoras because that's the projection onto, what do I get out here? <laughs> That's the projection onto. Okay, that's the projection onto C perp in the orthogonal or linear case. And uh, the proximal mapping, as a reminder, it's defined in this form. So you minimize a regularized version of F. So you minimize here over Z, and X is the point where you regularize over. Um, so that would be the, the proximal mapping. And then you have the subdifferential operator, which is the generalization of the gradient map. So please ask me if you have any questions. So that's a very famous 
subgradient operator is the absolute value function. This is a bad function from a differentiability point of view, but it has a beautiful explicit subdifferential operator. And so this is set valued. And what I talked about monotone operators, that's the definition. So you have to check things that lie in the graph of the mapping. And if this is true, uh, always, if this is always non negative, you have a monotone operator and you get this maximal monotonicity by Zorn's lemma argument. So every monotone operator can be extended to a maximally monotone operator. But they don't have to be gradients or sub differentials. Here's the one that is interesting. Okay, then if you have a skew operator, something like a rotation by 90 degrees, this is actually still maximally monotone, although it's not a gradient. Okay, so the class of maximally monotone operators is bigger than just subdifferentials. And the most famous result there in the area is due to Rockefeller, Brezis, and Moreau. Moreau did it for Hilbert space, which is good enough for me, but Brezis and Rockefeller did this even in non reflexive Banner spaces. The subdifferential is always maximally monotone. Very important in convex analysis is the indicator function. You set it equal to zero if you are in the set or plus infinity if you're outside the set. So that's like an infinite penalty you pay if you dare to leave the set C. And then associated with this is the normal cone operator. That's a very nice operator. And an example would be um, a linear subspace. Then the normal cone operator is just the orthogonal complement if you are sitting at a point in the set. All right, so that was just a quick refresher. Coming back now to the Fermi non expansive mappings. So, this is how they arise. And by Minty, it turns out all Fermi non expansive mapping, that's a famous result by Minty, they are actually resolvents of maximally monotone operators. So, this is a beautiful bijective correspondence between Fermi non expansive mappings on the one hand, these are the ones that you use in algorithms, and maximally monotone operators on the other hand. And you can go back and forth between them. And proximal mappings are special cases. They arise as resolvents of subdifferential operators and for projections. So it's a resolvent of a normal cone or the prox mapping of the indicator function or the projection onto the set. So you can think about it in many different ways. Okay, and here's another fact, not too hard to prove, but very beautiful. A mapping T is firmly non-expansive if and only if 2T minus the identity is non-expansive. And by that, I mean Lipschitz 1, okay? So that's a, a beautiful characterization here that allows you to, to just go to Lipschitz maps. And that's another correspondence. So you have three worlds. You have the world of monotone and operators, of firmly non-expansive mappings, and of Lipschitz 1 maps. And you can go back and forth between whatever's most convenient for you. And if you start, in the world of non-expansive mappings, okay, you can average, you can just solve this for T. Look at the situation, right? If you start with an R, solve it for T, and you see that a firmly non-expansive mapping is exactly the midpoint between the identity operator and the non-expansive map. Okay, so you can, that's, that's useful. So that's one way to think about that. Take a non-expansive mapping, take the midpoint between the identity, that's it. That's, these are the firmly non-expansive mappings. All right, now I come to the point of the talk after this little intro. Um, it turns out if you study Fermi non expansive mapping, it's not too hard to see at all that these are closed under convex combinations. So if you, if you look at some lambda i ti, you get a new Fermi non expansive mapping if the lambda i's are non negative and sum up to one. So they're beautiful under convex combinations, but they are miserable for projections, for compositions, okay? And here's a simple example. You have to go to R2. They're still good on the real line, but in R2, things go wrong, okay? In R2, you can look at the x-axis and the diagonal. So that's U and V. That's the x-axis, that's the diagonal. These are closed linear subspaces. Here are the matrices describing the projections onto these. They are now linear subspaces of dimension one, and they are firmly non-expansive because they're projections. And now you can look at their composition. So that's fun to do in MATLAB or Octave or Julia. So you can compute this matrix product. And it turns out that's not any more firmly non-expansive. That's a great exercise I always put into my, my course when I teach that. And you know, proof it's not firmly non-expansive. The easiest way to do this is come up with two points. And you have to maybe hunt for them. If you're unlucky, you don't find them right away. But here, if you put, if you find the point two minus two and zero, well, <coughs> Zero is 
unchanged because that's a linear operator. If you compute what T does to this vector, you end up with one, one. So if you now compute X minus TX, you end up with this one. And now you can compute both sides, right? So here, TX minus TY is just TX because TY is zero. So what was TX? It's one, one. If I compute the Euclidean norm of one, one, norm squared, that's one squared plus one squared, that's two. And uh, if I compute that guy, did I mess this up? I hope not. If I look at the identity minus T, I get here one and minus three. If I look at one squared plus minus three squared, that's one plus nine, that's 10. 10 plus two is 12. And if you look at what happens on the other side, that's two squared plus two squared, that's four plus four, that's eight. Okay, and the inequality is violated. So that's that shows you the composition is bad, okay? So these are beautiful mappings, but the composition is not good. Or if you work with the characterization that the, this version here is non-expansive, you can actually compute the operator more, and it turns out to be square root of two, which is not less than or equal to one. So that's another way of doing it. So they are bad, okay? So how, what, what do you do? Well, it turns out you can fix this problem by working with a little bit bigger class of metrics, okay? So the Fermi non-expansive metrics are not good for compositions, but if you relax the definition of Fermi non-expansive a little bit, it gets fixed, okay? So this is the notion of an average mapping, okay? So a mapping T is called kappa average. If you can write it as a convex combination of the identity and the non-expansive so if kappa is zero, you get the identity, arguably the most beautiful non-expansive or Fermi non-expansive mapping there is. And if kappa equals one, there's no contribution of the identity in general, and you just get a non-expansive mapping. So this is a way to, to think about, you know, average mappings. And uh, one says if you're average, if for, for technical reasons, one likes to exclude zero. I don't personally like that, but you would see we would divide by kappa, and if kappa is zero, that's why you throw that out, okay? But you definitely want to throw out one, because if kappa is one, you, you don't see anything, you just get not expansive, okay? So kappa less than one is the most important constraint. And here's, here you see why <clears throat> you like to throw out kappa equals zero, because you can characterize this property without mentioning n. This is a real property because it relies on a second operator n, but it turns out you can undo this and describe it in terms of t, and that's what you get. So t is kappa average if and only if this inequality holds true. Okay. So we see that if kappa is one half, one over one half is true, two minus one is one, and you get the definition of the minimum expansive. Okay, so that's a nice, that's a nice generalization, really. And it turns out most of you believe this in the audience. Many, many algorithms and optimization are actually iterations of average mappings. And I, I think a lot of you will agree. Okay, so this is a really good class of mappings. Okay. And notice that you might actually be interested in the constant. So typically in our community, you say, oh, you're average and you're done, because then you know you converge, your life is good, you get algorithms that converge, but you see something very interesting here. The smaller kappa is, the larger is one over kappa, and if one over kappa is large, you subtract a potentially very big term, so you make more progress towards your solution set. So you might actually be interested in finding the best possible kappa, because it would give you the sharpest estimates. Okay. All right, and I, I promised you that this fixes the problem. And here, <clears throat> here's the good stuff about averaged mappings. Obura and Yamada proved the following beautiful result. That's kind of sharp. There's earlier versions, but the constants are not as good. So they proved the following. If you start with the kappa one averaged map and the kappa two averaged map, and you look at the composition, you're kappa averaged, and the constant kappa is less than or equal to the sub amount. Okay. If you look at this stuff, I don't know if you have better insight than me, but for me, I can't even see that this thing is less than one. <laughs> okay, it doesn't look like it, but here's the proof it's less than one. If you compare it to one, you can multiply this up. You can simplify and you end up with this. So if kappa one and kappa two are less than one, you actually get a positive number on the right hand side. So the last thing is true, therefore this is true. And you found an upper bound for the 
uh, average constant here of the composition. So it's beautiful, it stays closed under compositions. So if you do this for Fermi non expansive mappings, you would choose kappa one and kappa two to be one half. So all I did here was is I looked at this result and everywhere I saw a kappa i, I plugged in one half. And if you do this, you get two thirds. And two thirds less than one. So that's good. You know, you get an upper bound, but notice that it's not a half. So and it's impossible to get a half because I showed you a counter example. So that's the best you can do, at least from this framework. So um so what's the goal of this talk? The goal is to introduce the modulus of averageness, which nobody did, to do. shockingly so far. In the linear case, I will give you a way to compute it. Okay, so if you like MATLAB or Octave or, or Junior, you can, you can compute it by any matrix. So that's nice. And we will actually compute the modulus for the composition of two projection operators. So I, I gave you the example with the x-axis and the value. Okay, so we will, we will figure out the best constant for that. Very nice. But that's what we will do. Okay, so shockingly, nobody has done that. And that's free money. Okay, so we were the first one to define and That's free money on the table, so we picked it up. So we define the modulus of averageness to be the smallest kappa that makes T kappa average. Okay, so that's what you want if you want the best estimates for your arguments. Okay. And uh, I wrote here min, and mean optimization, we are very picky. We write if, if we don't know if the minimum is attained, right? But the minimum is actually attained here because here's another characterization of averageness. This is one that I really like. It doesn't divide by kappa. It's actually my favorite one, okay? So this doesn't divide by kappa. And you can see um, that if you have a kappa n that converges to the infimo, where this is true for all x and y, you can take the limit as kappa n converges to the infimo for any fixed x and y because this is nice and continuous in kappa, right? So that's why the, the minimum is actually attained because you can just take the limits right here for every x and y. Okay, so it's actually attained. So what can you prove about the average? So now I go linear. So from the rest of my talk, everything is linear. Okay. So if you have a linear mapping that's non-expansive, it can, that's not the identity, that's like a special case, they have a kappa of zero, okay? Then you can, of course, you can use linearity, you get rid of x and y, you can change variables, you can compute it maybe as this supremo, okay? The supremo I don't think has to be attained, but at least it's well defined, okay? You have to work a little bit on it. So these results that I show you are not super hard, okay? Um, <clears throat> Here's a reduction that's cute, okay? If you have a non-expansive mapping with a fixed point set, and let's assume it's not everything, so it's not the identity. And if you care about what is the modulus of averageness of this combination, convex combination between uh, R, the linear operator, and the identity, it turns out it's this, okay? And you see here's a, a reduction to B perp. Okay, so you kind of, if you're lucky, if there's actually stuff in B, and B perp is smaller than the original space, and you kind of reduce also the problem, you work suddenly in a smaller space. And this is not too hard either. So this is useful if you have a non trivial fixed point set because then B perp is smaller than X. So you kind of reduce the dimension. So that's what you can prove. This is very beautiful and it will be useful at the end. Kappa of T is the same as kappa of the other. Okay, and the proof is a one two-liner. Okay. So if you write this as a convex combination, well, T star is likewise. And the norm of N is the same as the norm of N star. So that's it. Because if N is non-expansive, so is N star and vice versa. So this is nice. The kappa doesn't care about taking transposes or adjoints. And if you want to check for a concrete linear operator again and bring it closer to something that would be MATLAB or you know, Octave or Julia, here's what you could do. If you have a kappa given, form this matrix, check the eigenvalues. If it's positive semi-definite, you're done. Okay. So that's, that's how you can do it. How do we find the best kappa? Well, here's a way to do this, okay? Give yourself a square matrix assume it's non-expansive and how could you check that you can check that this this thing is positive semi-definite okay that's all computable 
And then you form two new matrices A and B, and that's of course computable. And what you do is, is you look at a list of orthonormal eigenvectors of B. Okay, and there will be positive eigenvalues. Look at the positive eigenvalues, order them without loss decreasingly. And if there is no such thing, then you were actually working with the identity. That's the case when, when M is the identity here, then this, this becomes zero and there's no positive eigenvalue. Okay, and only then. In all other cases, there will be positive eigenvalues. Otherwise, D is greater than or equal to one. Then you can create this D by D invertible diagonal, matrix D that has this on the diagonal. Then you form this matrix here and you compute its largest eigenvalue, and that's it. Okay, so that's how you can compute that if you actually want to know what is your, your best modulus. And uh, that's a nice linear algebra proof. You know, it's, it's kind of nice. So here's an example where I did this for the two lines in Julia. Okay, so this is the matrix I think you get when you look at the composition of the two projections. I'm not sure how well you can see that. And basically I did everything I just told you about on the previous slide. And if you form this matrix at the very end and you compute the largest eigenvalue, that's the eigenmax command, you get 0.63. That's what you get and change. Okay, so you get some decimal number. That's what you would get. And notice that 0.63 is bigger than one half. That's consistent. We know we're not firmly non-expansive, but it's, it's smaller than two thirds, which is the bound that comes from, from Yamada uh, or Gura. So, so it's, it's doing better. Okay, so can we figure out what this number is? Now, some of you happen to know John Bowen, and John would just pipe this into his inverse symbolic calculator and, and get an answer. Okay. And this will be consistent too. And in fact, Scott Lindstrom, some of you also know, did this when I gave this talk in Seattle. <laughs> And it got the answer. Okay, so now I do it in Maxima. So the first one was Julia, which is a poor man's MATLAB, and Maxima is a poor man's maple. Okay, it's free, but uh, I only know the syntax when I work with it, and a month later I forget everything. So this is how you would do this example in Maxima. So I'll show you how you do this in Maxima. Um, and, you know, I form this matrix and I, I compute this matrix T. That's the same matrix that Julia just computed the largest eigenvalue. Here is what you, you have something. It's quite messy. But if you ask it to compute the eigenvalue, something very beautiful pops up. And if you go to numbers, that's the one we just saw. Okay. And the inverse symbolic calculator would have told you that this is, is also. Okay, so that's the number you get for these two projections, the x-axis and the diagonal. The modulus of the composition is this number, but this number is now known to be a beautiful number. It's square plus two plus three all set. So that's that's what, how we got intrigued. Why is this? Can we explain how this constant arises? And in a few minutes, you will see how it arose. Okay, it's, it's very pretty. Okay. So here's the main result. I'm going to the main result. And the main result will be about this composition. So we do a little bit better than just looking at the composition of two projections. The inner one will be a projection onto linear subspace, but the outer one, we, we can do a little bit better. We can work with a relaxation. So this is like the relaxed version, the House, householder transformation, where the reflection into B, right? And if beta is one half, we come back to PV, the projection onto B. So the, the, the question, you know, we, we studied originally is beta one half, but we can do a little bit better. And by the way, Cesar, this looks like D minus D out, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of weird, right? <laughs> yeah, so. Um, <clears throat> So that's the T we get, and we will be able to explain what that is, okay? And basically, there's, there's a few cases that you have to study, and the first few I show you, they are doable without too much work, okay? So they're special cases. So if U is everything, or if U is a subset of V, you can compute it, and this is how, what it becomes, okay? It could be the, the case where U and V are both everything, which means the projections are the identities, okay? Or even the reflections here, right? So and that would give us zero, as we know, for, the, for that it's zero, okay? If use everything, 
So you don't care about the outer one, and it's just about basically about the projection. It actually bifurcates a bit. If V is non-zero, you get beta, which is nice. That's exactly your relaxation parameter here. And uh, if you use a subset, you end up with one half. Okay. And this is not a bad proof. You would do this as an exercise, and you will all figure that out if you take a little bit of time and think about this stuff. But the general result, so the case that is not covered by what I just showed you, is a bit more complicated. Okay. And the notion we need there is the Friedrich setting. Okay. So what is the angle between two vectors? Or what is the cosine of the angle between two vectors? Well, if you think about two vectors, you will agree the cosine of the angle between u and v is the scalar product. That's what we all learn in linear algebra and teach in linear algebra. But that definition is not so good if you think about two subspaces, okay? I'll give you an example, that's my favorite example. Think about u is the wall, and v is piso, okay? <laughs> v is the floor. Now, the wall and the floor, they have common intersection. It's the stuff here, okay? So because they have a common intersection, you can find identical vectors in the intersection. So the inner product would be one, and the cosine would be one. This means the angle between the wall and the floor would be zero in, the, in this natural definition. And that's not what we expect, right? We human beings, we think this should be a 90 degree angle, okay? And you can fix this, and this is what Friedrichs did, by factoring out the intersection. It's like a quotient space type construction, right? If you look at the intersection and intersect the original sets with the orthogonal complement, you cannot get rid of the common stuff. And you would get that the angle between the wall and the floor is actually 90 degrees. Okay, so that's a beautiful concept called the Friedrich's end. Yeah. And there's a beautiful result on the Friedrich's angle due to Solomon. Solomon proved that basically the Friedrich's angle between U and V is the same as the Friedrich's angle between the complements. It's a beautiful result, okay? It's not, it's not trivial, it's quite long and a little bit tedious. Um, to me, it looks almost like a duality result. And I wish, you know, this is on my mathematical bucket list, it would be nice to understand this result from a more general framework where this pops up as a special case, but I haven't succeeded. I've worked with Sean and the, the student on trying to generalize this to cones and working with polar cones. It doesn't seem to work, at least we couldn't make it work. So I don't know, this is a beautiful result. And if you want to learn more about angles, the work by Frank Deutsch is really the best. Mm -hmm. I mean, Frank Deutsch has beautiful articles about all the results you want to know about the Friedrich angle. There's two or three papers by him that are really the best to learn about them. So that's that's something we will use. And then you can prove the following main result. So T is the composition of a projection inside and the relaxation outside. We assume the remaining case. I showed you the, the cheapo cases. Okay, this is the hard case. And then you can prove the following result. That's the formula, okay? So cover of T is this mass, and it features the cosine of the Friedrich angle, okay? Um, between U and V. So that's the answer. And the proof, here's where we use the fact that we start with U. So you have one variable floating around, and that will help a lot in the proof. It boils down at the end of the day to an independent maximization where you have something in U and V. And then if you combine it with the Friedrich's angle results, you finally get the sounds. Okay, so that's a kind of a, a weird proof. I'm not, I'm not too happy about that proof, but maybe, maybe there's a simpler proof out there. But at least there's an answer there, and I don't think it looks intuitive, but that's what it is. Now we can revisit the composition of linear projections. So there's a special case we need to exclude. If U and V are everything, then the composition is the identity. So we know that's zero, but in, in the other case, that's the formula. That's really beautiful. Okay, so the, the modulus of averageness of the composition of two projections is this beautiful quotient, one plus c divided by two plus c. That's something that is memorable rather than the previous page, which is a mess. Okay, um, and you can get this from the main result by plugging in beta as one half. I remind you, we had the general result between the reflector and the identity. So beta is one half and you plug it in. That's what I did here in that line. 
and you simplify you end up with this and if you factor those two polynomials you get that and you can finally cancel the two minus c and you're done so that's nice and uh, it's interesting to compare it to the ogura yamada bound the ogura yamada bound turns out to be this and I'm going to make this. This is a beautiful bound that's, that is delivered by Ogura and Yamada. And I make it more complicated to fit our framework. And it turns out that their bound is exactly the same as our bound if CF is one. If the cosine of the Friedrichs angle is one, their bound is our bound. Now, in finite dimensions, this will never happen. Okay, in finite dimensions, it turns out that there's always a positive angle between subspaces, okay? So the cosine is actually less than one. So what this means is, at least for, for the finite dimensional case, we beat the whole, our bound is a little bit better, right? But in infinite dimensions, you can play funny things, right? You can actually construct two subspaces disjoint, only zero is common, with a zero angle, you know? Fun things you can do in infinite dimensions, okay? So you can construct one where CF is one. So it's good news and good news, okay? For them, it's good news because it kind of shows their bound. It's actually sharp, it's the best thing you can do. And for us, it's good news because we show our bound is, is actually better sometimes, right? So that's what, what happens there. And let's just revisit the two lines example. So that's what we had. I remind you on what we proved. That's what we observed. The Ogura Yamada bound tells us we are two thirds averaged. Let's compute again. We know what it is, but clearly the angle between the x axis and the diagonal is 45 degrees. The cosine of 45 degrees is 1 over square root of 2. Our result gives us this 1 over cosine plus 2 over cosine. That's this. And it turns out you can verify that this is this, but you actually have to do the multiplication. <laughs> to see that this true. So it was kind of very hard to generalize from this one, right, to that. That's not, that's not always how to go from here to there, right? But it turns out that explains the line, okay? This weird number here is actually much more beautifully written in this form. <coughs> and that's what we get. So we have now three proofs to compute this. We can use maxima to do that. We can use the main result. That's what I just showed you. And there's a third proof that I didn't show you, but it's one of the cases in mathematics. If you know what the answer is, you might be able to give a proof because you knew already the answer. So you can actually give a proof knowing that you know the answer already that is simpler. Okay, so there's an elementary proof, but it's cheating. You know what the answer is. You kind of verify it, right? But that's, that would be in the paper. Okay, so let me sum up. So a nice thing is that we uh, can apply the adjoint result that I mentioned. I, I remind you the modulus is the same for T as for T star. So you learn immediately something for operators that look like that. This is inside, this is outside, but this is all. Well, maybe for another week, depending on the <laughs> right? So this is open and that would be nice to know what the deal is here in general, I have no idea. The techniques in our paper give an upper bound, but we didn't even record it, but it's, I don't think it's necessarily sharp. You get an upper bound, but not the true answer. Okay, so we don't know what the true answer is. Um, if this is too hard, maybe stay with unrelaxed projections and try to bump it up to three. We haven't done that, but if you play maybe with lines in or two, that would be a good starting point to go in this direction. And you might try to become nonlinear. And in fact, for my colleague, Sean Wang, one of his uh, one of his master's students has started to work on it with some partial results on that. So there's certain cases where you can actually say stuff, <clears throat> even in the, in the nonlinear case. So um, that wraps it all up. I highly recommend this paper by Frank Deutsch if you care about the angle, and this has references to other ones. And this is the Ogura Yamada paper, and uh, finally, this is the paper that appeared in October last year, which is awesome. <laughs> Thank you very much for your really nice, clear, and interesting talk. And even even for someone like me that I'm not expert in the subject, I, I, I could understand a lot of things. <laughs> there are some questions. There is some question or like a I understand asking something. Okay. Beautiful. So, in which case the Okura Yamada 
found in this site. I suppose there will be yeah, some well, at least one example this could be uh, if you have two subspaces where the angle is zero and you can construct this in different dimensions. There's shop. I mean, I, that means you cannot improve on their form. They, they gave us the best general form there is, I think. Right? But if it's not zero, I mean. If it's not, if the angle is not zero, our bond is better. This, I, I didn't make that clear, but you know, it turns out this is not necessarily obvious just by looking at it. But uh, if CF is less than one, it turns out that our bond is better. But only if it's less than one. If it's one, it's the same. So if the angle is positive, this CF is the cosine, right? So if the angle is, is positive between the subspaces, our bond is always a little bit better. Okay, so in finite dimensions, it's, it's better actually. By a hair, maybe. <laughs> but do you think it's possible to get something in between, like a sharper bound than a Hura de Malva in some specific sure. case? Sure, I, you know, I mean, as I mentioned, there an archive, there's a preprint by a Russian student, and I forgot the details, but there, there's stuff you can say, and it's surprising that you can actually say stuff. I think this is actually wide open. You know, maybe for procs. I think he looked at some procs maps even and so on. This is not well studied. I don't think anybody really studied it. And if you think about it, it's actually strange because kappa is important for algorithms, right? If yeah. one over kappa is large or kappa is small, you get better estimates, right? So I, I think it's not not much explored at all, actually. So yeah, maybe you can do for special cases more. I know one thing. I don't think there's a good notion for a preview example for cones. I tried that because that's what always struck me. I hope that we can work some cones and have a paper with Paula, uh, not with Paula, but with Rui and Sean. We can kind of show and uh, probably not, even if you play with the polar cone, length of the polar cone, uh, all combinations, there's no, no, nothing nice as the Simon, the Simon effect or Simon effect. This is, this is such a beautiful result. I wish there was a more general version of that, but I don't think I, I don't know him. Yeah. Yes, sir. So to be for the um, so you only get the bound for the operator T, right? T is mm -hmm. so, um, have you tied with another one or for example uh, if you have some coercive operator there instead of because I think that for example in the in this no. model, in the general I see. Numbers. So you want to go from average to coercive and stuff like that? Yeah, but you know, so in, for example, you, you have some coercive evaluation of some operator there. Because I haven't looked at it. As I said, I mean, if you guys are bored and look for a research problem somewhere, this is very unexplored. There's one other archive preprint, you know, I think the student's name is Song, S-O-N-G. Um, and that's it. I, there's nothing out there that studies as many serious questions, you know. So it's very nice. And in fact, this appears in some papers where they try to get some bounds for some algorithms, and they also work with the compositions of operators, and they consider the operators separately, and then they get a bad bound, and it can be closer. Right. If they knew this. Uh, Okay. Right. I mean, the, the, uh, I should say the following, the, um, the Ogura Yamada bound was generalized by Combet and Yamada to, to model to operators. And um, if you have any prox operator optimization where you kind of are able to prove that the kappa of that guy is less than a half, you know, you, you should get a better result, right? Because you will do better if you stick it into the general you know, results in the composition of more than two operators, yes. So, yeah, I, I think that's kind of interesting, actually. Um, so and I, I think it's, it's wide open, honestly. I don't think many people, I mean, it's one, one guy, I think, Sean Student work on that stuff. That's it, that's it, in a serious fashion, yeah. Thank you. Another question? Okay. 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 Yes. Does it have to do with the fact that, for example, the linear projections converge with the linear rate depending on the cosine, the frame sometimes too. True. Is it because of the average model of uh, the Probably not. No? I don't think so. Um, 
because the rate for alternating projections will be the cosine squared or the cosine squared, I forgot, one of the two. And uh, that's not what our model is. So it's not quite the rate you, you get from the operator normally trying to get it from that point of view. It is, it's more a bond on the step size when you take this, this step, yeah. So I'm, I'm not claiming that this is necessarily the best, okay? But if you take what I did at the beginning, um, yeah, so if you're here, I mean, how would you apply it? Say X is a fixed point, or X is your current iterate, that would be X in plus one, and Y is a fixed point, right? So you would, it, it's, a, it's a measure of the progress towards a fixed point, right? That's why you care about average operators, right? You want that, you know, you want to, you want to prove that this goes to zero and then you use the demi closest principle and you're done. And you guys know me so well, right? Um, but here it's it's more quantitative. You know, you might if you if you are interested in how fast does this go to zero, then you might care about the cover. But I don't think the cover will necessarily be the answer. I, it won't, right? Because the cover is short with one plus c over two plus c, that's not as good as the c or c squared you get from from that very specific result. Okay. Mm -hmm. Model models are usually related with stability properties, and you know you know if uh, the average module is related, for example, with stability properties of uh, non-expansive uh, operator. Right. Yeah, the, you can think about it in that sense too, because if you know something about Kappa, and if you know that the mod, the best modulus is if you if you know where it is, right, then it, it tells you a little bit how much you can over relax. Okay, so so the smaller kappa is, the more you can de take larger steps. Yeah. Okay, so that's kind of useful, right? Yeah. Because you, again, you got, most of you know this extremely well, right? So if you know that, you can take larger steps, which might speed up your convergence. It might explain, you know, in some pictures what's going on there, you know, because sometimes the theory might predict only something for a certain range, but you observe it works for larger steps, okay? And that might work exactly for reasons like that. You can actually go a little bit more because the actual truth says that the, the constant is actually even smaller than the one half, right? And that means you can you can actually over relax more and, and you're guaranteed to, to still converge, okay? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So in that sense, it's a stability yeah. property. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, then thanks again, the speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.